there is a monthly meetup. Usually the first Saturday of every month is going to be here with me. So if you are enjoying these, these meetups, be sure to RSVP the next one. And I guess before I get underway also, in terms of shameless self-promotion, I, I love connecting with people online with social media. I have an Instagram. So if you wouldn't mind following me on Instagram, I, I'm getting close to 1,000 followers. And I don't know why that's a magic number, but I would love to hit it. So it's Rocky underscore Snyder. And uh, if you just go to Instagram and, and connect there. Now, also, this recording is going to be on my YouTube channel under the same name, Rocky Snyder CSCS. You can follow me on Facebook as well. There's a whole bunch of content. Every week, we pump out so much in terms of video content, at least three to five videos a week. Some of them are podcasts, and others are, uh, are more like quick hacks into your system. And I see more people are coming on right now because uh, you're going to find the tools to hopefully help you to change how it is that your body is, is feeling right now. So the beautiful thing about the internet is you can get a lot of information through WebMD and Wikipedia and any Google search you want. So these days when people come in and see me with issues in the tissues, they, they know a lot about it already. But let's just cut to the chase and do the basics of what tennis elbow and golfer's elbow is. So if you're suffering from pain on the outside portion of your elbow, right about here, that's often called tennis elbow. And in the medical world, they'll call that lateral epicondylitis. Now, if you have pain on the inside of the elbow, right against that bony part, right inside there, that soft patch there, well, that is golfer's elbow and they call that medial epicondylitis. So the epicondyle, are the two bumps of the end of your arm bone. So you got your humerus, and when the bone comes down and meets the two forearm bones, eh, we call it an elbow. But it's basically the space that occurs between those three bones. And again, the bump on the outside of the, of the upper arm bone, the lateral epicondyle, we've got these muscles that come from the front of your forearm and they attach right into that epicondyle, at least not the muscles so much as the tendons. So that when I extend my wrist, those muscles are gonna shorten and they're going to apply a good deal of, of tension right against that anchor point. And the opposite will occur when I flex into my wrist, then the muscles on the inside of my forearm that attach to the tendons, that attach to the medial epicondyle, that's where we receive a lot of tension there. So the itis, epicondylitis, itis is Latin suffix meaning inflammation. So you can have tendonitis, bursitis, uh, appendicitis. It just means that that area is being inflamed. It's not giving you the reason why it's being inflamed. It's just the, the term used for inflammation in that area. So there is a conventional approach that is, well, it, it's the, the go-to for most medical doctors. When you go into your urgent care, your primary care provider, and you go in with the complaints of pain right out here, whether or not you are a tennis player, it just so happens that the downstroke is a very common way if you're doing it improperly, not with the most efficiency, that you're going to irritate an area of the body. And this is one of the more common places. And tennis players love playing tennis, so they do it a lot. And that motion over time, doing that motion improperly or inefficiently, could irritate an area, such as the lateral aspect of the elbow. And then we get inflammation, and there you go, the tennis player right there. So, and the same holds true with the golfer coming down, flexing and rolling the wrist inward could create a lot of poor mechanics over time of repetitive action, irritating the inside of the elbow. All right. So there you go. You, you take your complaint in to your urgent care doctor, primary care provider, whomever it is. And what are they going to do? What are they going to say? Most likely there's a few approaches that they're going to say. Uh, one is we're going to ice that down, which 
That is the typical approach when something inflames, you want to ice it down to reduce the inflammation, which is neither here nor there. If you want my own professional opinion on it, I just think of where do old people go when they retire? Do they go to Iceland or do they go to the Palm Desert where everything's warm? Do their joints feel better in Arizona compared to Alaska? So would that make me think that bringing warmth and cuddling and love to that area might be something that we want to consider instead of just throwing a, a whole bunch of snow and ice on it? I don't know. You could see for yourself. But for me, I typically stay away from ice a lot of times. There are some times that, that it warrants it, but more often than not, bringing warmth and heat to an area may be a little bit better. The other thing they can do is they're going to brace it. They may give you one of those little Velcro straps that just gives you a little bit of pressure or tension against that tendon. And what is that doing? Well, it is restricting movement, which is another way of kind of asking you to rest it. So there we go. We're going to ice it. Then we're going to rest it, or we're going to even put a brace on your arm so that we immobilize it. So we're not going to get it to move, which that's okay. Here's an area that is getting irritated because it's moving improperly and it's moving a lot through repetitive action. So it makes sense that we try and give it a break. But if we're taking movement away from one area, we're going to be applying it somewhere else. So now we've taken improper movement mechanics, we've reduced the area of movement, and most likely it's not going to be this amazing corrective tool where you suddenly move properly and efficiently. Now you've got to find a new way of moving. And chances are it's not going to be the same and it's probably going to be inefficient, causing another area eventually somewhere down the road, weeks, years, decades later, whatever, that eventually get inflamed and you're going to encounter pain in, a, in another place. Uh, Anti-inflammatories, there's another one. They're gonna give you some drugs to reduce the inflammation uh, and they're going to keep it from moving to reduce the inflammation and they're gonna ice it to reduce the inflammation. And then there's also surgical approaches. There's one known as FAST, which is an acronym that basically is talking about breaking up scar tissue and pulling it out of that area which can provide more space and, and take away a whole bunch of adhesions that may be causing a lot of improper movements to occur. So that, that's one way of doing it. But here's the thing that none of them have done. One thing they've all done is they've only addressed the symptom of pain, but none have looked at the underlying cause of why it's occurring in the first place. They may chalk it up to repetitive motion. Okay, if that were the case, then every single tennis player and golfer would be, have elbow pain because if that's the, the movement. I actually went online and, and looked at other causes and they said, lifting a heavy suitcase. I'm like, really? Interesting. I, I don't know, before wheeled suitcases came about, I don't think a lot of our grandparents or parents were complaining of of elbow pain because of too many trips to the airport. All right, I don't wanna to get too snarky here and I'm not trying to be sarcastic. What I'm really trying to say is let's stop treating the symptom and let's start looking for the underlying cause. Now, where does the elbow begin and end? In anatomy books, it's where this part of my forearms meet this part of my upper arm and they just focus their camera right on this joint. But that bone continues up and that becomes part of another joint. So the arm bone that is creating the elbow is also dictating the shoulder movement. And like that old sawbones song, how one thing's connected to another, well, the lower portion of these two bones here meet a whole bunch of bones, like 27 of them, that make up my hands and where they meet this part of my elbow, we call a wrist. So I've got the lower elbow, the upper elbow, and the middle elbow, if you want to consider it in a different light. So if my middle elbow is giving me problems, could it be unreasonable to think that my upper elbow 
may be not moving in the proper way, asking the middle elbow to do more work. Or if I've been doing a lot of typing and writing and, and other stuff to really create restrictions in my lower elbow, could that be affecting my middle elbow? We can keep on going from this upper portion that connects to my collarbone and my rib cage, which connects to my spine. So if I've got restriction here, could it affect the quality of movement from my shoulder, which will therefore affect a repetitive action of my elbow or my wrist? As weird as it sounds, we can go all the way down to the big toe. If my big toe joint isn't moving the way it should, it's not going to help my foot mechanics, which will affect my ankle, therefore driving my knee into a compromised position, causing my hip to do something else, causing my spine to have to coordinate how to do something over a compromised hip, which would send my shoulder into a different position, which would cause my elbow to do something unnatural and therefore create a symptom. It's a lot of stuff. So if you thought that we were going to be here for an hour looking at forearm stretches and different types of typical traditional things that you might find with physical therapy, uh, please think again, because we're going to be doing something completely different. We're not going to be just addressing the area of discomfort because that's not where the problem lies. For some of you, it's because of this shoulder was misbehaving or you're always carrying your backpack over here or something like that. For somebody else, it's because you were walking the dog and you tripped and you fell and you bruised this hip. And that was five years ago. And the hip feels better, but it changed how your body moves and negotiates with one another until finally something started to manifest in the regards of tennis or golfer's elbow. Somebody else has had a knee replacement and you've gone through physical therapy, the knee's feeling great, you're back on the court, you're loving life, but you weren't really taught how to properly load or unload onto and off of that knee. And the hip is not really doing what it should above the knee and now the elbow's bugging you. These are stories that come in here all the time. And so we track down the clues in how the body moves to understand where the restrictions lie. Where is it moving too much? Where is it moving not enough? So we're going to be going through a bit of assessing within your body to get a sense of what these shoulders are doing. And if we get something in those shoulders, are there some movements that we could do to remind the shoulders of their role? And then we're going to reassess how the elbow feels after each of those movements. So it's not my hope that you're in pain right now, but it would be kind of nice if you were feeling it a little bit to act as a barometer to know if what we're doing is going to be beneficial or not. So what we wanna do is I don't want you to hunt down the pain in your elbow at all, but if there is some discomfort, just get a sense, bring some awareness into that area. When is it that you feel the discomfort? Because I'd like you to check back in and see, maybe a little bit later, how things feel. So um, some people call me a magician because I will do something with this big toe down there and suddenly their neck pain is gone. Or we'll work on this hip and suddenly this wrist isn't blocked up and the carpal tunnel is feeling better. And they, people without knowing, well, without knowing the answer to the trick, so to speak, you just think of that as magic. But with all magic, there's, there's really no such thing as magic. There's always a reason behind it. But with any magician, I brought along a magician's assistant in the form of my daughter, Madison. And so, Maddie, why don't you come on up here for a second? And there we go. I'm glad she's standing behind me because I look taller that way. But if we were side by side, she'd be towering over. Tr top, uh, just truly optical illusion. All right. So I'm going to have Maddie do an assessment along with you. And so what I would encourage you to do is if you're comfortable enough, kick your shoes off and stand in your bare feet so that you don't have that uh, uneven surface of worn shoes on one foot and then the other. So you're just gonna be in bare feet. And we're going to assess your shoulders to begin with. So you can take a quarter turn to the side just so we can see a little bit. And with your arm straight at the elbow, we're just gonna slowly raise the arm up overhead 
and get a sense of what is the quality of your movement like? Not just how far can I raise my arm, but when does it start to kind of get muscly? When does it start to get restricted? Or when do you feel resistance? And then compare it to the other arm. And can we just get a, a general sense if there's one that is different than the other? Try this a few times because you might find that you get a, gain a little bit more range of motion, kind of warming up the movement, that's fine. But there's gonna be eventually an end range to that action. Do you find that in order to get your arm up, you have to tilt your rib cage or your spine back, or you have to lean in certain direction? Do you find that when your arm comes up, it gets to a point and then suddenly you start bending at the elbow and the arm starts floating off to your side instead of the arm coming right up almost nestled beside your ear. What, how do you raise that arm? Okay, you got a sense of it? Was there one that was different than the other? Yeah, my left is harder. Left is harder, okay. So the left is more restrictive. It doesn't mean that she's going to suffer from left elbow pain necessarily. It could be anywhere in the body. That's the amazing thing of how she's living and how she subconsciously moves her body. Uh, over time, it could be somewhere else. It could be the opposite elbow. So just because you got a sticky shoulder here doesn't necessarily mean that it's got to be your, your, your same side elbow. Okay, so you've got that sense. And you may want to just jot notes down if, you're, if you want, if you've got a pad of paper and a pen. Just get a sense of which shoulder is a little bit sticky. Which one, to, is there one that causes a little discomfort when you get to the top? Do you get a pinch or an impingement? What is it like? Could it be that the restriction here is causing something else somewhere down the road? So now you're going to be standing facing forward with your palms face forward also. Still, we wanna keep the elbow out of the equation so it's just gonna stay straight. And can you bring the arm up overhead? And what is that like? Do you feel that your head is kind of drawing toward the arm because it's restricted? So your head, if your head heads to the arm, then your brain says, well, we're getting closer. Check on both arms. What is it like? Do you notice that you lean slightly to get the arm up or the head goes in one direction? Does the arm rotate forward or backwards? Does the elbow begin to bend? These are the things that you want to bring awareness to. How do you raise it? What was that like? Left one was still harder left one was still harder. Often what I find is the person that's sticky going forward on one shoulder, the opposite shoulder will have a harder time raising out to the side. Doesn't mean one thing or another, it just means that, you know, this is how you move. Okay, and then let's check out internal and external rotation. Now here is where you might get a little bit stuck because if the elbow does a lot of the turning. When you internally rotate your arms, there may not be any rotation of the upper arm. So what I'm gonna have Maddie do here is when she goes into that, go ahead and come back up, this soft patch, the crease of her elbow, that's where I want you to focus your attention on. Not on your hands and wrists turning inward, but I want you to try and turn the inside of your elbow inward. And what does that feel like? And go outward. Does one go a little bit more than the other side in either direction? All right, so now we're getting a sense of how your shoulders move. And just for a show of hands, I'm gonna put on a little different view so I can see all you lovely faces there. Just for a show of hands, uh, did anybody notice a difference between their shoulders? There's a few, okay. So let's try and do a few movements for the shoulders to try and free up and remind these areas. And then go ahead and check in with your elbow. And we're gonna do one movement and we're gonna do several repetitions of that movement that focus on the shoulder girdle. And after one set, check in with your elbow and see, do you notice any difference? You may not notice immediately. It may take a little while for it to have effect, but who knows? So Madison, she's, Maddie's gonna stand with her feet underneath her, preferably about you know hip to shoulder width apart in a comfortable stance. And looking down at your feet, can you just make sure that they're, they're both turning straight ahead so that we're as balanced as can be? All right. And then in this position, you're gonna keep your arms by your side. You're gonna raise the arms up straight shoulder height. 
you're going to rotate the elbows so that the palms face upward. And then keeping those arms straight, you're gonna raise them all the way up overhead as far as you can. If you can touch the fingers, that's great. And then lower them down to shoulder height. Rotate the elbows downwards so the palms face down and bring them back to your side. So Maddie, I would like you to try and do about, let's go for 10 repetitions. Good. That's it. And I just want to watch her do it. Great. Now, for some of you, you may keep on going because you're doing great. How's that feeling? Good. Good. Okay. For some of you, you may already be feeling like, wow, this is actually surprisingly more effort than I was expecting. Yeah, this is going to be a little bit of work, especially if we're going to be awakening tissue that hasn't been participating the way it should. You've got one area that's screaming because it's doing way too much and it's really quite angry. In fact, it's inflamed, causing that issue. And you've got other areas that are like slackers in the workforce. They haven't been complaining. They're never gonna complain because they're not doing enough work. They're always in the corner by the water cooler having a conversation with somebody else that's doing their work for them, right? So we gotta balance things out. Keep on going, you're doing great. Now, one thing I might look for is if she is restricted in her shoulders, I might see that the elbows are gonna try and move. They'll either begin flexing or you may be one of those individuals that hyperextends, which is another way of getting movement just beyond a straight line more than you actually should. But hyperextension in one joint means there's lacking movement somewhere else. All right, so that's about 10 to 15 repetitions of these. And all we've done is just reminded the shoulder how to pull away from the body to rotate a little bit and move toward the body. Check in with your elbow and let's just see how that feels. And if there's any positive change, well, there you go. There's one tool that you can put in your toolbox. It doesn't mean that it's going to be the answer to, to all of the problems in life, but at least we're down the road to a better recovery. So now what we're gonna do is we're going to do one of two ways of incorporating a ball and socket motion to the arm or to the shoulder. The first one we call shoulder rolls. And you're just going to relax your arms down by your side. You're going to lift your shoulders up. You're going to draw the shoulders back while they're still elevated. You're gonna drop them downward and let them come forward at the bottom. So in some ways it's kind of like a square where we lift up, pull back, drop down, come forward. And for most people, I'm going to encourage you to do the backward motion for right now. The nice thing about shoulder rolls is we're working on waking up the whole shoulder girdle without asking the elbow's advice in life. And the elbow is one of those that is just always awake, always alert. It's ready to do whatever you need it to do, even though it's tired, fatigued, and inflamed. It is so used to doing more work than it needs to that any given moment, if other areas aren't going to be participating, the elbow will most likely try and compensate. In list, at least in this situation. So if I have my arms down by my side, you may start finding that your elbows start bending when you do these shoulder rolls. We don't need to have that. Just try and relax the arms and you're gonna make these rolls while your arms are down by their side. Now, you may be experiencing a little bit of work back in the, do you feel that? Yeah. Yeah, so you may be experiencing like between your shoulder blades, those muscles are going, oh my gosh, what the heck is that all about? Something is waking up, beautiful. Check in with your elbow once again. Just reassess whatever movement it is, whether it's just extending, maybe it's extending the wrist or flexing the wrist. I don't want you to try and irritate it. Just get a sense, has anything changed? Okay, so let's get a little bit more into the shoulder with circular action. And we're going to involve the arm weight with this movement. And we, again, want to keep the elbow out of it for the time being and focus just on the shoulders. You're going to bring your arms up to shoulder height once more. And you're going to make circles, maybe about six inches in diameter. And we're going to pay attention to the quality of your circles. The nice thing is you've got the screen right in front of you, so you can watch. But if you're watching the recording right now, just do a mirror at home. And you can see that this side is moving a little bit more than the other side. 
It's very subtle, but that right one looks like it's more free than the left. So I'm just gonna encourage you to just bring awareness and try and bring some balance. Now, after say maybe 15 to 20 circles, I want you to flip your palms and elbows in the opposite direction. So the soft patch your elbow is pointing up to the ceiling. We call that external rotation. That draws the shoulders back. You should feel like your shoulder blades are pulling a little bit closer together. Your chest may be lifting up a little bit more too. Give me about 15 to 20 circles. And you're saying right now, I don't like this guy. This is a lot of work. This is burning. Yes, it could be, but we're just awakening some areas. Drop your arms down, relax after that. Check in with the elbow once more. Now, this is not to say that your shoulder is the underlying cause. Maybe it is, maybe it's somewhere else. We'll be going to different areas of the body and checking out movement there too. But we're gonna do it in a kind of a progressional way. We got one more for the shoulder. So far, just to recap, we brought them out to the side, brought them up and down. We could either use the shoulder motion forward and backward without the arms, or we could do the same thing with the arms. So there's another movement that the shoulders are responsible for, and it's kind of like a hinge function as if you'd find on your door frame. So Maddie here is going to take her fingers and she's gonna curl in her knuckles like so. She's gonna place the first two knuckles, her index finger and middle finger, outside of the eyes, right on the soft patch of her temples. The thumbs will be face down, so the palms are forward. And she's gonna hinge those two doors, the elbows together, so to close the door and then open back up again. This is probably, for most people, going to be the most demanding. And for some of you, you cannot bring your elbows together. We're patient. We'll wait. We've, we've got plenty of time right now. So you just keep on moving those. Now, for some of you, you're doing this, but you might experience your head trying to get out of the way in order to bring your elbows together. If you are one of those that's looking more like a pigeon than a person, I'm going to encourage you to stand against the wall, such as right over here. And we're using the door frame or the corner of the wall where her head and her hips are against a wall. And that way she's got to maintain good alignment and stacking of all the bones in her body or the joints in her body. And now she's forcing herself to really work on opening those shoulders. And again, you might feel quite a bit of work between the shoulder blades. So these simple re-educational experiences for the shoulders are really getting them to move differently. And if you felt like there was some restriction there, then there are some things that you could start to do to unlock the restrictions so that energy and force can transfer more readily from your midsection, from the ground, all the way through your arm. Because if this is restricted and I lose a certain percentage here of motion, I've got to gain a higher percentage somewhere else. Could it be here? It's quite possible. So how do the, how do the elbows feel? Check in with that. Did, did somebody else have another question? Yeah, uh, this is Tara. I, um, I noticed that on the last, uh, the last round with like the um, thumbs down that when I started doing that, that my forearm got more irritated. Is that something that it's like, because that's good, I'm opening up, or is it something that I should like, oh, maybe that's not the one for you? What, uh -huh. Ah, wonderful. Well, um, let me see you do it again, if you wouldn't mind. Okay, so. Okay, now bring your knuckles forward so that they're against the temples outside your eyes. Okay, look here. Okay, and I want you to bring those arms together. Okay. Uh -huh. All right, so you can see that now I really want you to bring the arms together. Get those elbows together. Come on, you're a strong lady. There! That's what I want you to do. Give me five of those. Don't you stop on me like that. <laughs> Keep on going. So Tara, what she experienced is that a compensatory motion that is very reinforced in her frame kicked in when other areas weren't. Now, how's that feel? That was better. That was better. I did feel a touch in my wrist, but I I don't quite know. I'm, yes, yeah. All but right. It better in terms of the forearm and I didn't feel it like radiating as much. Excellent. So because this is a new movement for you, I would recommend only five at a time. 
but you can do several rounds of five as often as you like to really get those shoulders moving. Now you can feel how much work and effort that took to unlock your shoulders. So it, it may require a little bit more reinforcement, but the more you open that area up, just as you felt immediately, how this reduced that, that communication of your forearm to your brain. So definitely, it's, I don't think it's a poor, uh, poor movement for you. I think it's actually one that you want to encourage more of. Just make sure that you're doing it in the proper way. Knuckles on the temples, elbows come in and touch. And watch out that your wrist is not curling in this way or extending out that way, that it stays nice and flat as you come in. Watch out that one elbow isn't higher than the other or lower than the other, but they're going to try and come in right at the same point and come back out again. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. So let's move on to exploring a little bit of a different place, such as your spine. Is We're going to explore your rib cage. And in, in so doing, we're going to look at your spine mechanics. Beautiful. Look at this. My assistant just came back magically reappeared without the sweatshirt. How nice. So Maddie, what I'd like you to do is you're going to turn sideways so we can see your profile. And what I'd like you to try and do is imagine that you are in a, a bank teller's vacuum tube at the drive up window and you are the canister. So you're in that plastic tube and that canister fits nicely. So you don't want to slam your head into the tube forward or backwards. You've got to keep your body right in that tube. And you're going to try and tilt your rib cage forward and downward and then upward. And if you want to place your hands just below the breast line or along the rib cage, you're welcome to do that. And what I'm curious to see is, can you flex into your spine and can you extend your spine? These are natural movements that the spine should be free to perform. But if I am fixated in one position, it's going to have a direct effect on my shoulder, which feeds into the elbow. So what is that like? Can you get a sense of moving there? Or do you feel like you jam up your lower back? Or is this just a, a foreign direction to send the rib cage? Do you have a hard time going in one direction? You feel like your shoulders are doing the movement in place of the ribs and the spine. So these are just really nice personal assessments of how you move. So then let's do another assessment. Now with Maddie facing forward, right at the center of her sternum, that is the axis of rotation or the zero point of motion. Can she tilt the rib cage off to one side and off to the other side? But can she do it without slamming into the, the tube that she's standing in? So tilting, yes, but not using the shoulder to lift upward. So what is that motion like for you? Do you have the freedom to tilt and keep this point in one location? Or do you find that that is really, that's like, I don't even know what he's asking me to do right now. That thing is so foreign. All right. So if, I, uh, if I'm unable to achieve this motion, I'm going to be unable to open up tissue, muscle tissue here, but also I'll be unable to really properly drop my shoulder or elevate the other one. Same thing when I go here. So if I lack movement here, it could very well be manifesting elsewhere. All right, so now you've got an understanding of how well you flex and extend the spine and how well you laterally flex it left to right. One side might've felt really easy, the other side not so easy. Then let's work on rotation. So feet underneath you, Keep your, keep your hips as still as possible and just turn the upper body to the left and to the right. Does one direction feel easier? Does one direction cause crimping or cramping in muscles? Does just simply doing this spinal motion feed discomfort into your elbow? They're all possibilities. Now, I'll ask you a question. When you rotate the rib cage to the left and to the right, how are you rotating it? Meaning, are you pulling back on one side to go that direction? 
or are you driving forward with the other side to go in that direction? And when you rotate in the opposite way, how are you doing that? Some of you are only driving forward while some of you are only driving back. And then there's a few of you that are probably driving forward with this shoulder or this side and drawing back and you're not even using that side. How wild is that? So now you're beginning to understand how it is that you just subconsciously move your body because we just take it for granted that it's just gonna do what it's supposed to do. But often there's just a, a very unique movement pattern, just like your fingerprint. No two people move exactly alike. So you have a very unique way of, of doing things. And sometimes that can add up to irritation. So if we can give you more efficient ways of moving, maybe that's gonna help. So let's get into feeding movement through your spine by incorporating arm action. So Maddie's gonna come front and center. Her feet are gonna be underneath her. She's gonna look down again, just kind of noticing that where her feet are. And if one's turned out, the other one's straight ahead. Just appreciate that, but let's see if we can't pair them up and be both straight ahead. Uh, we're going to pay attention to the movement mainly of the upper arm. And the reason why I say that is because I can get my wrist and my elbow to move without any motion at my shoulder. However, if I think of moving my upper arm, you can see the, quite the difference. So place your attention in the upper arm bone, the humerus. And what you'll be doing is having your arms right, right dangled by your side. And you're going to what we call internally rotate both arms at the same time so that the arm bone is moving inward. And then from there, you're gonna go in the opposite direction and you're going to turn the arm bones, those upper arm bones outward. We're gonna do this for a couple of minutes because I'm gonna guide you through what else is occurring in your body when you rotate those arms, or at least what we wanna try and encourage. So as she internally rotates those arms, where do your shoulders wanna go, forward or backwards? Forward. Forward, all right, so hopefully you're feeling the same way. When you internally rotate your arms, the shoulder is gonna go forward. And do they wanna go up or down? Down. Ah, now the natural way for things to happen is when we internally rotate the shoulders, they should be going upward. So this is a beautiful example of a mixed signal. When she internally rotates, she was going downward. Doesn't mean she's gonna have shoulder problems. Could be some lower back discomfort, could be a knee issue, could be whatever, but if we get these to be in sync with each other, she's gonna be a happier body. So when you internally rotate those arms, allow the shoulders to draw forward and upwards, right to almost your jaw or your earlobes. And then unwind. And as you externally rotate, which way do the shoulders wanna go? Down. Down and back? Yeah. Down and back, all right. So when we turn the arms outward, the shoulders should descend and go back behind you. And when they turn inward, they should go forward and upward. Can you get that to occur? Now, as you continue with this, the rib cage is gonna to have to kind of get out of the way or the, the shoulders are at least going to encourage movement from the rib cage. So when the arms internally rotate and the shoulders go forward and upward, do you get a sense that your sternum is dropping downward, causing a little bit of flexion in your mid back, curving your mid back, and then as the shoulders draw down and back because the arms are externally rotating, do you get a sense that the sternum is lifting up? The rib cage is kind of tilting back and the spine is extending. Can we get shoulder motion to relate to rib and spine motion? And that's what we're doing. We're encouraging this movement to unlock the spine and the shoulders. And in so doing, we're not, we're not even touching the elbow. And actually, if your elbow is talking to you, check in. Make sure that you're not using the arms to be your driving force, but your upper arms. That's it. Now, I'm going to add one more thing to this. We didn't even bring in the lower body. So we're going to bring in the lower body right now. When you come from turning inward like so and going outward, I want you to bend your knees ever so slightly. And when the arms rotate forward and inward, I want you to work on just straightening your knees. So we're straightening them here and we're bending them here. And just work on that a little bit. 
we are working on integrating movement through the entire body because there's an area that's being isolated and is not connected with the rest. And it is really irritated. And no matter how many drugs and surgeries you get, if you do not reinforce proper biomechanics through the entire body, then a symptom of pain will most likely manifest somewhere where it's being asked to do too much or too little. Okay, beautiful, good job. Check in with your elbow. How are things feeling? Is it changing? Now it's not to say that maybe it's more irritated. And if it's more irritated, that's actually wonderful information too. It doesn't feel good, but it's telling you something's not quite right. It doesn't mean that that movement was necessarily bad. There's no such thing as a bad movement, but how you executed it, well, that's the issue right there we might have to address. Okay, so we've gotten this motion of the spine. Check in with your ability to, to tilt the rib cage forward and backwards. Did that improve any just by getting this to occur? And if this is improved and fluid and moving, well, maybe it'll have a really nice long lasting effect on the elbow. Okay, so now we also checked in with the rib cage side to side. So here's what I'd like you to do, is you're going to be taking one arm up overhead while the other arm is reaching gently downward. And then you're going to switch. Good, and we're gonna turn this into a little Saturday Night Fever dance move that John Travolta made famous back in the late 70s. We're gonna have you bend one knee while the other leg stays straight. So when the arm goes up, I want you to bend that same side knee while keeping the opposite leg straight. And you'll feel how that tilts your pelvis, which will tilt in the opposite direction of the rib cage. So now you're moving with attitude. You're letting one hip drop while bending into that knee, straightening it out, and then bending into the other one. The knee that you're bending is the arm that's reaching up. And when I say reaching, I want you to reach with not just your hand. I want you to reach with your elbow. I want you to reach with your shoulder. And when you do that, that's when the magic occurs. That's when you feel the tissue really start to open up. Because some of you are just giving me this for a reach. But I need you to reach here. I need you to reach here. I really need you to really lengthen and open. Can you do this while keeping your head in one place? Or are you feeling that head just winging side to side? Because we're not looking for that. Can you stay in the bank teller's tube and just reach up that vacuum tube back and forth? Beautiful. Okay, rest for a second. Check in with your elbow. How's everything feeling? Usually we have a better time when we invite more friends to the party. All right. So far, we've explored this dimensional space forward and backwards. We have explored this dimensional space side to side, but we're three-dimensional creatures. We need to explore rotation. So what I'm going to ask Maddie to do, and I think I'm going to target her left side first because that was the shoulder that gave her a little trouble. I'm going to have her start with her feet underneath her, parallel, and her left arm forward with the palm face up. And she's going to turn her body to the left. And she's just going to continue turning to the left, allowing the hips to rotate, allowing the ribs to rotate, allowing the head to rotate, and bringing that arm back around. And then she'll bring herself back around. And then what we're going to do is we're going to flip the palm face down and we're gonna continue over to the opposite side, rotating inside that bank teller's tube, the hips rotating, the rib cage, the head, the arm, almost like tumblers in a lock. Can you get the hips to rotate? Can you get the ribs to rotate? They reach their end range, the head rotates, the arm rotates around. That's it. Continue for a few more repetitions. 
Yes. Now, if you feel this in your lower back, check in with your hips. Maybe your hips aren't really turning. If you feel this in your neck, check in with your rib cage or check in with your head. Maybe there's a place that's holding on. All right. Now we can do the same thing on the opposite arm. So let's just go to the right arm and you're gonna go flipping palm up as you rotate on toward the same side and around. And then when you come back and face center, that's when you're gonna flip that palm down and carry over to the opposite side. And essentially we're trying to get different segments of your body to move. One rotating one direction, one a little bit on top of it, or moving in true opposition with one another, forward and backwards, opening up and closing joints, lengthening muscles and shortening them, just giving them this sense of almost like an accordion of breathing into your body. Because those places that are gunked up and restricted are not breathing very well. All right, we're almost there, we're doing pretty well. Let's check in with your shoulder range of motion. Let's just do that. What is that like to bring it up forward to the side? Those same kind of, is that different? Better, yeah. Better, cool. So hopefully some of you are experiencing a better experience of movement. And then also if those areas are moving better, I'm imagining that elbow isn't going to complain. Kind of like when Tara was doing the elbow touches and was really trying to have the forearm do all the work. But as soon as we got those shoulders to move, that's gonna be a different story. Beautiful. Okay, now I do wanna to touch upon the hips because we've only worked on upper body, but this is where your center of movement is. This is where the first muscle has to contract in order for me to take a step or sit down or whatever the case may be. So we've focused on all this area up here and down the spine, but let's finish off with a little bit of, of hip action. So. Let us just get right into one movement, which is going to be, we call it strike mechanics, based on the moment your heel strikes the ground. So you're gonna take one leg and step forward with that leg. You're gonna just, yes, just like that. Now, here's the thing, is that I didn't tell you to take the right leg or the left leg forward. You chose the one that you've been naturally doing. And if we're gonna change anything in your body, we should probably start here. So go ahead and switch legs. You're gonna be more awkward, you're gonna be slightly off balance, and you're probably gonna be more restricted. But good, we need to change. So Maddie's going to have her left leg forward in this case, because she chose her right one initially. And Maddie, I would like you to take the roof of your foot and your big toe and draw it toward your body by lifting it up. Now your heel is gonna stay on the ground. When you pull that foot up toward you, do you feel how your knee wants to extend or lengthen? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So we want to make sure that knee is not flexing or bending, but by pulling the foot up, we get that knee to extend. I want you to gently kind of tuck your tailbone just a little bit. And I'm going to ask you to get some weight on the outside portion of that left heel, that forward foot. And the way to do that is to push the hips back and back to the left while the arms are going to reach forward. And then come on back up. I want you to give me maybe about five or 10 repetitions. Now, compared to the traditional way that you've been taught in gym and aerobic classes when stretching out the hamstrings, first of all, we're not trying to stretch anything. We're trying to load tissue as it lengthens. So if you're feeling this burning, searing situation in the hamstrings, the back of the knees, that's not what we're looking for. I want you to feel the weight of that forward leg, 25 to 30 pounds or whatever it is. I want you to feel that heel pressing into the ground as you push or pull your hips back behind you toward that same side. And the spine, I want you to allow it to curl and flex. In fact, you can take your arms and internally rotate them as you reach forward and then come back up. So as those hips go back behind you, and off to the side, you can take the arms and reach forward toward the opposite side to help you with your balance. Just like that, moving back and forth. Great. Now you could do it on the opposite leg, but I have this kind of feeling that you might need that side more than the other. It's not to say that you don't wanna do the same thing to both sides, but you may wanna be a little bit more biased on the side that you feel most restricted. Now the other thing we might wanna do is just a little bit of opening up the front of your hips. So, what I'm going to have you do, Maddie, I'm just going to get a cushion here for comfort. 
you are going to be placing one foot here facing that direction. Now you may want to have uh, walls or tables nearby because don't want you falling over and harming anything. And we've placed the, the roof of her foot on the, on the seat cushion here. And you can see that her knee is directly underneath her hip. And her head is basically right above her hip as well. So this whole, she's got some nice posture here. The other foot is forward. And we're gonna encourage her to do here is just level off her pelvis so that it's not tilting down in the front or lifting up in the back, but just like the waistband is nice and level. So we may have to lift up the front side of the pelvis to kind of just level it off. And once in that position, you should be feeling a good deal of lengthening in the front of the hip and thigh. Do you feel that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to encourage a little bit of a connection between that area and the elbow by asking her to take the same side arm as the knee that's down and lift it overhead. Now you can see the angle of her arm is slightly forward. So I'm just gonna see if I can encourage it straight and I'm gonna try and just pull it up gently like so. Do you feel how that opens up there? Beautiful. Now for some of you, this is going to be a very intense position. So you may not need to have your foot on an elevated surface, you can just have it on the floor. You can come on out of there at any point in time. But those hip flexor muscles, the front of the thigh and the pelvis could very well be shortened and in pulling you into a position here, which is going to compromise the shoulders position and so on and cause a lot of restriction somewhere that is encouraging the elbow to move more. So I think that brings us more or less to a close on the movement experience. And now's the time with the time that we have left where we can just shoot some questions and answers. So I can see already that there are some comments here. Ah, let's see, somebody asked about breathing. Well, yes, I do use breathing, but there's only so much that I can put into a, a format like this. For instance, when we were doing the spiral action of those arms, we call them arm cogs because we move like cog wheels. If I externally rotated my arms, my shoulders went back and my rib cage lifted up, that's the, that's the universal body language of inspiration, which is another way of saying in, inhaling, inspiring compared to expiring, right? Our respiration. So when we externally rotate those arms and the rib cage lift, beautiful time to inhale. And then when we internally rotate the arms and the rib cage sinks down and we flex our spine, oh, that's a wonderful time to exhale. Moving back and forth and incorporating that diaphragmatic work would be really a wonderful way to do that. And we can do the same thing, breathing in, breathing out, breathing in and opening up some space. So I like that. Let's see, where could I learn these from you? Oh, well, again, the YouTube channel has, uh, I think we're up to almost 500 videos and I did write a book. I've written a few, but the most recent one is called Return to Center, which is strength training to realign the body, recover from pain and achieve optimal performance. It's a Kindle version as well as a hard copy called Return to Center. You can find it on any major booksellers, but I have 150 videos that I've embedded into the pages of the book in the form of a QR code. So you just take your phone, turn your camera on, hover over the little, the, the geometric square shape next to each movement, and instantly a YouTube video will pop up with me explaining a little bit more in depth about what you're doing. So all those videos are on the YouTube channel. You don't necessarily have to buy the book in order to, to benefit from going to there. And should we be mindful of our back arching too much when we bring our arms overhead? Yes, yes. So yeah, it's kind of like Goldilocks, you know, uh, too high, too low, just right kind of thing. When the spine is overly extending, somewhere else is not moving with the way it should and it's kind of compensating. The same thing will go for flexion. So we want to go into a certain range of motion and be aware that you're not moving something too much in order for something else not to move enough. And that is an individual kind of pattern that people develop. So I, we do do consultations online and in person and, and I do a lot of this troubleshooting with individuals that have chronic or acute pain. And that's a lot of what I do. So people from actually around the country and some from international will 
will sign on with me online and we'll go through an entire assessment protocol with posture and movements and see if we can't uh, find ways to unlock it, understanding what the history of your life has been that may have created the place that you're in right now in terms of surgeries and accidents and injuries and so on, because they have all contributed to how you move individually. Is it best with rotation to keep the lower body still or move? Ah, well, with the arm driving rotation that we were doing, there's several ways that we can try to create more movement in different areas by not moving one place, by moving another. But in general, with the one we were just doing, I would encourage the whole body to experience rotation because when the hips rotate, you create a rotation into the knees, down into the ankles and the feet, as well as up through the spine, through the rib cage and across the shoulders and through the neck and the head. So if you can get everything moving and just explore how it is you rotate right compared to left, I think that's a really nice exercise. I have done lots of corrective exercise, but it is totally different. What method are you using? Oh, very good. Well, there, one of my mentors, his name is Gary Ward. He wrote a book called What the Foot. And he's the first person that I know of who has mapped out what every joint in the body does through the entire gait cycle. So when your foot strikes the ground to the very next time the same foot strikes the ground, that is one gait cycle. It occurs in less than one second, but in that time, all of your bones should go through a certain range of motion. The joints should be able to flex and extend and move sideways and rotate internally and externally. And there's a whole bunch of, of joint mechanics that we as humans being on two feet should be able to do. So we use that as a mapping process. It's called anatomy and motion. So if you're interested in anatomy and motion, there are online coursework that you can take. I'm one of the mentors within that structure too. So if you're interested in biomechanics, I highly recommend it. It's a wonderful thing. Yeah.